Range lead the way, gentlemen. Zach Allred here, starting out the Lethality series with what is ultimately, I think, one of the most important skills you can have, even if you aren't, you know, trying to be a, a warfighter, infantryman. Um, if you're an outdoorsman or you're do it all, and specifically in special operations, rule number one is look cool, which is, you know, super important. And then rule number two is don't get lost. And the goal of this is to get you to a level where you are, I guess, textbook savvy on land navigation. And then the goal is for you to go out and acquire a map of your local area or of a national forest and to go and actually train this. It was brought to my attention the other day in a comment that the army has got a, uh, like a land nav simulator game. I messed around with it a little bit yesterday before I recorded my intro to lethality video and it was a little finicky. Uh, I'm going to play with it some more and see if it's viable. I will link it in the bio uh, or rather the description of this video below mm -hmm. if you want to go check it out. Um, but it was a little finicky for me. Like I plotted my points and then like I put my map away in the game and they disappeared. So I'll have to play with it some more and see if it's actually a, a good training aid. Obviously, it won't be as effective as the real thing, but it, at minimum, you can practice plotting points and... Uh, and using a compass virtually, I didn't get much further than uh, than just the start. So I digress. So why is land navigation important? So end state goals for part one is you're going to be able to accurately read a map, able to identify key terrain features. You're going to be able to plot points and you're going to know your pace count. So why land navigation is important. It's a basic soldiering skill. Everyone regardless of who they are, what MOS they have, should be able to navigate from point A to point B in an effective manner, an accurate manner. It's going to build your confidence in the field, and it's vital for mission planning, which is you know going to follow further along down the line here in this series. So this is the... Uh, it's There's a reason it's so foundational in the Army, and it's for that last, that last bullet point. And it's a reason why they tested at most, you know, NCO schools or uh, trade ox schools is it's it's something that doesn't get trained a lot, but it's it's crucial to know to know how to do and to be able to do it effectively and without getting everyone lost. And then and then you go into more specialized MOS is such as, you know, 13 Fox, where if they don't know where they are, they're not going to be able to accurately do their job whatsoever. You know, calling for fire, you need to know where you are so you don't accidentally call artillery or an airstrike on yourself. And the argument can be made that, oh, GPS is, uh, has made this skill kind of irrelevant. And I'm going to argue that it's not because something that we've kind of have figured out is there's electronic warfare. People are able to potentially determine where you're at if you're using GPS and or be able to jam your GPS signal or change it in a way to uh, to make you lost. There's a whole whole slew of reasons why being able to accurately navigate with a map and a compass is still an important skill to have. And even when Ranger would go out on mission, like someone would be carrying an actual map, you know, like a real real life paper map of the area that they were going to be operating in as a complete backup to, you know, the phones, the, uh, the Garmin wristwatches, etc. So it's important to know how to do. So getting right into it, what is a map? The definition, textbook definition, a map is a geographical representation of the Earth's surface drawn to scale as seen from the top down. And there are many different kinds of maps. You got road maps, you got atlases, You've got, uh, you know, just your basic wall maps and whatnot. Uh, this series is going to be focused on the topographical map because that's what you're going to be using. So there are a bunch of different kinds of map scales. So the smaller the number on the right, the larger the scale of the map. You got small, one to a million, medium, one to 250,000, and then large, one, one to 50,000. And the majority of the maps that you're going to be using the... Uh, are going to be 1 in 50,000 or 1 in 25,000. So to read a map, first of all, we're going to talk about marginal information now. Exactly like the name implies, around the margins of a map, there is a bunch of information relating to reading this specific map. And again, they're unique to each map. 
Some information is not immediately relevant. Uh, important features I'm going to highlight in yellow. That's going to be you know following this slide. So every map is going to be different. Uh, there are going to be major key, generally key information nuggets, if you will, on the sides of every map, though. And they're going to be in different spots. Some of them might be at the top, some might be at the bottom. You just have to familiarize yourself with the map. And in the Army, a lot of the times your maps aren't going to have this information. Like a lot of the times it's going to be a, a uh, just a printer sheet of paper with your your land nav course on it. So you're not going to have like the, the sheet name, you know, all this extra information. You're going to have the, the essentials, which we're going to get into here, but you're not going to necessarily have a gigantic actual map for at least like the like the land nav courses you'll do in ranger school. You're going to get an actual map, at least in mountains in Florida. I think Darby still kind of uses your you're kind of using a smaller, smaller size map, if I recall correctly. Uh, in part two of this video, I have a, a ranger school mountain phase map that I'm going to be pulling out at the end to kind of demonstrate and, you know, show you guys on an actual map and kind of what that actually looks like when it comes to like planning points, um, like route planning and then actual like reading the terrain and whatnot. So the first thing you've got is the sheet name. It's the title, top center margin generally, or in the lower left sheet number with the sheet name. And this is mostly as a reference material for for the map sheet so that you're able to go and find adjoining map sheets and with the help of the adjoining map sheets diagram and it'll show the eight different sheets and their sheet names and numbers at least the numbers adjacent to that sheet so you're able to go and try and hunt down if you needed like an adjacent map if your ao was was in the middle of those two maps special notes not super important Declination diagram. This is probably the most important thing after the legend. Actually, you know, I take it back. This is probably the most important thing on a map sheet. So it indicates the direction and relation of true grid and magnetic north, also known as the GM angle, and how to convert grid to magnetic and magnetic to grid. And we'll get into that a little bit later. So scales, it's going to give the scale used on the map, and it'll show you the distance in miles, meters, and yards. Generally, you're going to you know, use meters because that's that's how the military works. We use meters. Contour interval tells you where the vertical distance between contour lines is on the map. Unit imprint tells you who made the map. Not really important. Grid reference box tells you the two digit grid zone designators and where the boundaries are between grid zones on the map. Again, not super relevant for your day to day use of a map. It's important to, you know, be able to find this stuff, but it's not going to affect your land navigation abilities. And then your legend, which gives the uh, the date of the map data, which can be important. Um, if it's an older map, you know, older than 10, 20 years, like you're going to want to know that erosion has been going on. There might be new structures, new roads built that might not be on that map. So you have to keep that in mind. If it's an older map, like you might run into trails or roads. That, those are the two big ones that I'd be mostly concerned about that aren't going to be on the map. And this is when it comes down to knowing your pace count and, you know, knowing where you are and keeping track of where you are while you're out walking these lanes. So that if you do run into something like a road, you don't mistake it for a different road. That's just a, a loose example here. All right. So this is your declination diagram. This is what it's going to look like. Again, we're going to talk about this a little bit later on when it comes down to the practical stuff. This is just, you know, baseline knowledge. So you've got your grid north, you've got your true north, and you've got your magnetic north, and you've got the, the differences here in the degrees. So this is your scale. You can use it to plot distance using like a little sheet of paper. And, you know, if you have a bunch of points, we're going to talk about this in part two, but if you have a bunch of points, you're going to be able to basically make a miniature version of this on a piece of paper and plot out exactly how far it is between different points, because it's not going to be in a straight line generally. Again, make sure to use the meter scale on this. Nope. Got to go back. All right. Contour interval. So this is, this is your map scale again. Um, so this map specifically is a one in 24,000 meter scale and then your contour interval is just going to be a little quick little thing where it's going to say contour interval x amount of feet x amount of meters this is an example of a legend again these symbols are going to be you know different 
depending on your map, but this is a general what you can expect on on a map. Again, yeah, unique to your specific map. So just make sure to read your legends, know what you've got on it, what you can be expecting on your map and in your AO. Contour lines. So this is what makes a map essentially 3D. And it looks like a bunch of squiggly lines at first, but you'll quickly be able to, to tell exactly how steep something is or what kind of terrain you'd be expecting. They connect points of equal elevation on the Earth's surface and are used to illustrate relief or topography on a map. So the closer together these contour lines, the steeper it's going to be. And the further apart the contour lines, it's going to be much more flat. And again, refer to your contour interval in the marginal information. So this is what it looks like on your map. I move myself down here. It's going to look something like this. You've got your contour lines and it looks like a pair of titties almost. Um, and but this is what it's actually going to look like in reality, more or less. So you're able to see here where these lines are, you know, pretty close together, you know, very steep. And over here, you've got, you know, pretty spaced out and it's a much more flat of a grade. Move myself back on up. So here's another another example. So you've got three different kinds of contour lines. You've got your index lines, which are going to be bolded, and they're generally going to have the elevation marked on that line. You've got your intermediate, which is going to be the lines in between. There's generally, you know, about four in between each index line. So you've got index line, so intermediate, 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 another index line. And sometimes you'll run into supplementary lines. So what a supplementary line is, and you've got between this point and this point, and you've got this index line marking it. That's basically saying that this distance here is about half of the, is half of the contour interval. So if this was example forty feet contour interval map, this would be a twenty foot twenty foot difference essentially. So colors on a topographical map. So it's going to tell you in the uh, in the legend generally, but this is if it's going to be different from this. But this is generally what you can expect. So black work of humans, buildings, railroads, bridges, boundaries, and names. Blue is always going to mean water, lakes, ponds, rivers, streams, waters, water wells, and marshes. Brown is going to be for relief features, so your contour lines and elevation. Green is going to be wooded areas, forests, orchards, heavy vegetation. Red is going to be used for larger, more important roads and surveying lines. And I want to say that this is this has changed because red is not readable under red lens light. Purple is for overprinting. You're generally not going to see that on a map. And then white is mostly clear of trees. So it's going to be like fields, rocky slopes, and open kind of country. And a lot of the times your, your map is going to have some of this information in the marginal notes. And then as far as like the roads and, go, roads and trails go, that information is going to be in your legend. So it'll say like a solid bolded line is, you know, in a hardball improved road, a not as solid line is going to be maybe an unimproved road. And then like a dash line will be like a trail, for example. So terrain features, and these are all going to be the same on every single map that you ever see in your topographical map that you see in your entire career and your life. There are five major, three minor, and two supplementary terrain features. And most, some of you guys might already know this stuff, so whatever. Major terrain features, you got hill, valley, ridge, saddle, and depression, and a mnemonic, mnemonic, to help you remember this is a hidden valley ranch salad dressing. This is a hill. A hill is a point or small area of high ground. When you're on a hilltop, the ground slopes down in all directions. So you'll see these concentric rings getting larger and larger. And then the smallest one at the top is going to be the top of your hill. And generally hills are going to be either named or numbered on your map. Valley is a reasonably level ground border on the sides by a high ground. A valley may or may not contain a stream. Contour lines indicating a valley are U-shaped and tend to run parallel a stream before crossing it. So we've got your, your high ground here. You know, it's sloping up a little bit this way as well. And you've got a water feature down at the bottom here. So this would indicate a valley. Ridge is a line of high ground with height variations along its crest. The ridge is not simply a line of hills. All the points of the ridge are higher than the ground on both sides of the ridge. So it's going to look like this where it's going to come up. And then you're going to go back down a little bit. You're going to come back up and then you're going to come back down. So again, pay attention to your contour interval and then you're able to, uh, to identify this. So a saddle is a dip or a low point between the crest 
along the crest of a ridge. A saddle is not necessarily the low ground between two hilltops. It could just be a break along an otherwise level crest. So this is a good, great example of a saddle. And then coming back here, technically these spots here, you know, are also saddles. Depression is a low point or hole in the ground surrounded by all sides with higher ground. And generally these, when you see like hash marks like this, it's going to, the hash marks are going to be pointing towards the low ground. These aren't super common to see on maps, honestly. It's generally not, not always marked and it's kind of a, kind of a rare thing to see, but you've got a spur, which is a short, continuously sloping line of higher ground. And it's usually going to be coming off of the edge of a ridge or on its way up to like a hilltop. And these are great for, for planning routes because you're generally going to walk along the side of a on long a spur because it's going to be not as steep as just going straight up the hill. Um, and it's going to be better than going through a draw. You've got spurs here gradually sloping versus if you were to come, you know, this way where it's going to be much steeper draw. So it's similar to a valley, except that it is a less developed stream course. And then there's not going to be any level ground. So a valley, this would be a valley, very flat, very open a draw, you're going to have high ground on both sides and it's going to end, you know, somewhere along the way. So right here, you've got your spurs and then you've got your draws in the middle of it. So you generally don't want to walk through this stuff. You generally want to avoid walking through a draw, up a draw, across a draw. It's going to be a bad time because they, it can get really, uh, really difficult in there. It's called busting a draw, basically, is where when you have to like either go through it or across one. So generally, unless you you have a point inside the draw, try to avoid those. And then you got your third minor terrain feature is a cliff, a vertical or near vertical slope. It may be shown on the map by contour lines being close together with uh, a ticked contour line indicating the lower ground. Or it's just going to come together like this, you see, where you got your contour lines here and it all becomes one or they'll just be like very, 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 very close together here. It's, I haven't ever seen a cliff marked with uh, with these hash marks. It's always generally just it'll look like more like this and then just become one solid line or like almost like a bolded line. So last two supplementary terrain features cut and fill. These are not super often that you'll find these on a map, um, but it's basically a feature where terrain has been cut away by people, essentially a minor cliff, or where it's been filled in, creating more level ground that would normally be seen on a natural terrain feature. So it's usually, you'll see it next to a road or like a railroad. So you've got a cut here, again, pointing towards the low ground, cutting through this little line here, and then you've got your fill where, you know, they built up a little bit to, uh, to make this level for this train track. So again, these aren't super common that you're going to you're not going to run into this very often. And what it'll do more than anything is maybe provide a point of reference on the map a little bit easier to identify than like a road per se. All right. So now we're going to get into talking about how to actually read a map and plot your points. So grid lines are a series of straight lines intersecting at right angles, forming squares on a topographic map. So horizontal grid lines are numbered west to south or west to east rather, and vertical lines are numbered south to north. So a, vert a grid square coordinates are found by combining the identities of the horizontal and vertical grid lines that intersect at the lower left hand corner of the grid. And you're going to read to the right, I guess this way, that's, yeah, that's your right, <laughs> and then up. So you're going to read your north-south or your east-west lines, and then you're going to read your north-south lines. Writing up your ass is a good way to remember this. And you'll see here what I mean in a second. So you have your grid lines here. So you have your east and west running lines. And the further you go east, the higher the numbers are going to go. And this is the same on every single map. And the further north you're going to go, the higher the numbers are going to go. So when we say read right and up, for example, if we wanted to find grid reference or grid square 4820, we're going to take our... The first number is going to be the east to west grid, so the, the ones that are vertical. We're going to find 48. All right, we found our, our east and west running line, north and south. Yeah, you know what I mean here. And then you've got your, your northing line. So we're going to head north here, and we found our 20. And so 
this reference point, it's going to be this entire square. It's always going to be the bottom right hand corner of the square is where you're going to start. And that's where you're going to use your protractor and getting into this. So we'll talk accuracy of grid coordinates. So with this as an example, you've got, you know, 4820. That's going to be this referring to this square, square specifically. And that's accurate to 1000 meters. As you can see, this point is in the middle of, of all of this. So grid square or a six digit grid is going to be, it's going to look like 50, 48 X 20 X where the X is going to be another number here. And then this is going to be accurate to hundred meters. So with that, we're going to be using our protractor and we're going to be sliding it along here and it's going to be within the, uh, the whole numbers on that protractor. And again, I'm going to show you guys what this means either in this video or the next video where I actually will plot points for you. Eight digit grid is going to be accurate to 10 meters and it's most commonly used. And then you have your 10 digit grid, which is accurate to a meter. And that's generally not as commonly used. It can be, it's going to be very, very difficult without the use of a GPS to find an exact 10 digit grid. But the grids you're going to get in, in, in lab nav as well are going to be eight digit grids. Plotting a grid coordinate, you're going to first determine the scale of your map and you're going to find the closest scale to use on your protractor. And that's going to be pretty easy. You're just going to match your protractor triangle with the, the grid square. And again, if this is sounding confusing to you at all, I'm going to show you exactly what it looks like on a real map. And then the next is going to be the determinant the grid square your point is. What people do, let me back up here, is they're going to split an eight digit grid down the half just to help make it easy. So your first two digits you're looking for are 49 and 18. But again, we're going to read over on the map till we find 49. And then we're going to read up until we find 18. And then in that bottom right corner is going to be where we're going to start plotting our point. And then you're going to use the correct, again, using the correct scale of your protractor, align the bottom right corner of the protractor to the bottom right corner of the grid square. And then you're going to slide that protractor, you're going to slide it to the right until the right edge of the scale intersects the point. And then you're going to, you're going to slide over it and you're going to get your horizontal position first. And then you're going to, you don't slide it past that. And then you're just going to use your, your pencil and trace up the top of it until you get to your point and you mark it. Again, it's kind of hard to, to just say in words. So this is kind of a messy graphic here, but it's going to show you essentially. So again, our given grid is 49, 55, 18, 85. So we go over, we find our 49 and we go up and we have our 18. So in this case, it was, you know, right here at the bottom. So we start, and this is the, when they're talking about the bottom, right? This is the bottom right of your protractor. And it's going to start at zero, zero. And we're going to use our vertical coordinates it's kind of it's kind of distracting because we're going horizontal here for vertical coordinates but then we're when it says vertical we're talking to the vertical moving coordinates or the grid lines rather so 55 and it's kind of blurry here but we're going to find the five and there's going to be a, an intermediate line here and we're going to line that up with the bottom right corner of our grid square and we're going to hold it there and then what we're going to do is our next number is 85 we're going to come up the side of the protractor here and find the eight and the five. And then that's where our point is. Map scale here wasn't really important. It's just, it's a little bit faster just to, you know, match the grid square to your, uh, your grid triangle. That's what I, or your, uh, your protractor triangle that is. So one in 50,000, this is the one in 50,000 triangle. All right. Now we're going to talk about GM angle and the types North. So true north is a line from any point of the Earth's surface to the North Pole. Magnetic north, it's going to be shown by your compass needle, points to the North Magnetic Pole, which is not the same as the geographic North Pole. Grid north is the north that map makers, map, makers, map makers put on a map, and it's dependent upon the map projection used. Generally, it's going to be the top of the map is north, and it's going to be you know nice and uh, nice and squared. It's not going to be like kind of your grid lines are never going to go diagonal. It's always going to be up and down, left and right. So again, this is what your GM angle is going to look like on the marginal information. You got your magnetic north, true north, grid north. It's always grid north is always going to be straight up and down, like ninety nine point nine percent of the time. I don't think I've ever seen or heard of a map where the grid north is, you know, off to the side like true or magnetic north is. We need to know the difference between magnetic and grid angles. This is super important for getting accurate azimuths and depending upon your map, 
you're going to, you know, refer to the declination diagram in the margins. There are some places in the world where the uh, the GM angle and the conversion isn't, you know, isn't extreme. So you're not going to really need to, if it's off by, you know, like one or two degrees from each other, like you can safely, you know, it's safely within the margin of error when it comes to this stuff. However, that's not the case for most places in the world. Most places in the world, you are going to have to do the conversion. So converting magnetic and grid angles. Using the declination diagram to convert a grid azimuth to magnetic azimuth, you will subtract the GM angle, so 21 degrees. So if we had a grid azimuth, you know, mapped out on our map with a protractor of 45 degrees, and we wanted to convert it to a magnetic azimuth to actually walk between these two points, we're going to subtract the GM angle. So 45 minus 21 leaves us with a degree and a heading of 24 degrees northeast, roughly. So now if we had a we took a, an azimuth with our compass and we're, you know, for example, we're using it like on a road and we're trying to find exactly which road we're on on the map. And we shoot an azimuth down this road and we get, let's say it's a 165 degree azimuth uh, roughly southeast down this road. To get that on the map to accurately plot it and to find out exactly what which road this is on the map you're going to need to add the GM angle. So if it's 165 degrees, we're going to add this 21 degrees, and that's going to be 186 degrees. Pace count. This is very vital to land navigation, and this is going to determine how far you've walked. And it's going to vary based on your terrain. And going uphill, we're going to talk about this in a little bit, but going uphill, your pace count is going to be greater. Going downhill, it's going to be generally a little less. To keep track of it, you can use tools such as ranger beads or pace beads. Um, generally, you're going to have at least nine beads on a ranger bead set. And after every 100 meters you walk, you're going to slide the beads either up or down, at, you know, however however you want to do it. I would generally like slide them down. I had them on my, uh, my fighting load carrier here, and I would slide the little beads down every 100 meters. And you're going to have nine of them. Now, there are some ranger beads where they have the nine and then they'll have like four beads that are separate from those to keep track over all of your of your thousand meters. So that's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is that I've also used was rocks. <laughs> it sounds super basic, but I would find like, you know, like nine rocks and I would start with them in my left pocket. And then, you know, every 100 meters, I'd move one of them from the right to the left or left to the right, whichever one, and keep going until the starting pocket was empty. And then I would know that I'd been about 1,000 meters. Or once it was empty, I would go another 100 meters, rather, and then I would know that I'd been 1,000. So there's different ways of doing it. Some people, there's a lot of people out there that hate on the ranger beads. Um but I'm telling you when you're in these selection courses or when you're out in ranger school and you haven't slept, it's going to be very hard for you to keep track of your pace count and exactly how far you've gone. Again, if you're doing short distance movements, like less than a thousand meters, like you don't really need to use them. This is more of when you're walking for, you know, more than a couple K, you're going to want to keep track of it accurately with the pace count. So here's how to find your pace count. All land nav courses you do in the army are going to have a pace count area and it's going to be accurately marked. It's generally going to be on a flat piece of road and it's going to have a start and end point. And even if you do know your pace count, it's recommended to do this because it might have changed or you might be wearing extra equipment compared to the first time you took your pace count. If you don't have access to the land nav course or you know you just want to do this for fun, you're civilian, you can use one of those uh, measuring wheels. You're gonna measure and mark out 100 meters in a straight line with one of those, like on a roadway or something. Or I think the best method is to go to a like a high school track, you know, after hours, or like a public track, and use one of those straightaways. So this is a uh, track. Sorry for the kind of shitty graphic, but you're gonna go to. Gen you're gonna want to choose the 100 meter start line. This is gonna be marked the best, and you're just gonna walk until you hit the finish line using the method I'm going to talk about here. Don't do it on the curves. It can be a little different because you're going to have to use these. Uh, you'll have to use these freaking arrows as that marks 100 meters here. But just use the straightaway. You're going to want to walk at a normal speed. Don't overthink it. Just, you know, normal pace. 
and you're going to keep track of how many times your left foot hits the ground. There's some people that do their right, but I use my left because it's easier to remember because in the military, every step when it comes to drill and ceremony is going to be started with the uh, your left foot. So just use your use your left foot. And you're going to start at the beginning of this 100 meter course that you've marked out or that you have access to. And every time your left foot hits the ground and only your left foot, you're going to, you'll come out with a number generally between 55 and 70. That's, that's a wide range. Mine is uh, 66. That's pretty consistent across the times that I've done land nav. 66 steps is a hundred meters for me. It's pretty accurate for me. And you're gonna wanna do this at least two more times. And then you're gonna wanna take the average of those three. So your uphill and downhill pace count. Uphill pace count is gonna be higher than your level pace count. Downhill is going to be lower. Um, I'm gonna put this in the link or in the description as well. Um, this is a soft rep article. Don't really like soft rep because they're uh, they're kind of douches. But this they've uh, explained a pretty ingenious way of finding your uphill and downhill pace count. And again, you, it's kind of hard to do this because uphill and downhill is it's going to change like you no no two areas are going to have the same contour interval like some places are going to be steeper if you're about to go out on a landing of course and you can find a good approximation of the terrain and have the time to do it this guy is going to tell you exactly how to find that average uphill and downhill pace count for the area you're in again it's going to be very situational and area dependent on on this but for in general your your flat pace count is going to be the same wherever you go so here's some resources i use this uh it was some rotc kind of thing i pulled a lot of the graphics from there's the link to that and then fm 21-26 is the official fm i've got a copy here there's a lot of more advanced techniques in here field sketching a bunch of stuff so i would pick up a copy of this it's it's going to be a little bit foreign to most of you guys, there's a lot of really good starter information. Everything that I've talked about in this in this first video is in that book. Give it a buy. I think I paid, I paid like eight bucks for this one. And you can find these online as PDFs as well. I just like having physical copies of, of FMs. That's all for this one. This next video we're going to talk about in part two, we're going to talk about azimuths. We're going to be talking about actually, you know, plotting your points and figuring out what route you want to take during land nav. We're going to be talking about what to do if you get lost and how to not get lost. We're going to be talking about some techniques that'll help you find your points if you think that you've run up on a point and you can't find it. Part two is going to be out next Wednesday. I'm going to be working on the PowerPoints for that one this weekend. Stay tuned. Hopefully this was informational for y'all. If you have any questions whatsoever, ask them down below and I'll answer them or let you know that I'm going to be covering it in the next video. But all right, I hope y'all have a good one. Talk to you soon.